Shriek Rap Radio number 684, a therapist's memoir of addiction, redemption, and hope in unlikely places with Carter Stout, Ph.D. It's Shrink Rap Radio, all the psychology you need to know and just enough to make it dangerous, it's all in your head. And now here's your host, Dr. Dave. My guest today is Carter Stout, Ph.D., a Los Angeles-based psychologist who specializes in depth psychology, the process of uncovering hidden self-destructive tendencies, and treats anxiety, depression, addiction, and trauma. Stout is the producer of three award-winning independent films, which open doors to meeting and eventually treating celebrities in the entertainment industry. Stout, himself an addict, has been in recovery for almost 15 years and describes his grueling experiences with drugs and alcohol in his memoir, Lost in Ghost Town. Now, here's the interview. Dr. Carter Stout, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm eager to speak with you about your your new book, Lost in Ghost Town, a memoir of addiction, redemption, and hope in unlikely places. And I have to congratulate you on writing such a readable, fast-paced book. Well, thank you so much. It, it, is a, it was a first effort for me. It's the first book that I've written. And of course, because it was my own story, it really flowed out of me very easily. And I got it onto the page pretty quickly. And uh, I'm so, so glad that you, you found it compelling and exciting. Yeah, I know other people have remarked on how it's like reading a novel. And I'm a big fan of reading crime novels and so yeah. on. And, and <laughs> if we didn't know, you know, if you weren't swearing that it's true, uh, it would pass as that. Uh, yeah, it yeah. could. You know, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a very, you're right, it's a very extraordinary story. And uh, it's it's hard to believe that I lived through it. It's almost like another lifetime, really, when I look back on it. And yeah. I needed some distance from it before I could really tell the story. Yeah. I needed to work on myself. I needed to do some healing, a lot of healing, actually. And I, but I knew in my heart that it was a story that I always wanted to tell and I always wanted to get out there. Yeah. You and I were having a bit of discussion uh, before I turned on the recorder uh, and that you now are uh, not only a psychologist, but are uh, practicing uh, depth psychology, which is a tradition yes. that, you know, that I have. My listeners will know that I, I've interviewed a ton of Jungian uh, yes. people and so on. And yes. uh, and you say you're lucky to have lived through it, and th that can be taken in two ways. You know, one is, but there's a literal level at which you know, I as I was reading it, oh my God, you know, you could have yes. ended up dead multiple sure. times. Well, multiple of course, times. you know, uh, when we speak about addiction, and and the the memoir really does focus on my addiction from a very early age and how it uh, evolved over time, but when I speak about narrowly escaped with my life, it really refers to the fact that I had uh, become involved in a very dangerous world, a world of gangs and a world of uh, the commerce of selling and distributing drugs in Venice, California. And the nickname for Venice, California at the time was Ghost Town. Now, that's so shocking to me because yeah. I, I grew up in L.A. Uh, uh, I'm older than you are, so I, I, it was a lot earlier. But Venice was a wonderful place. And uh, I used yeah. to go to the beach there with my family and yeah. and uh, along the boardwalk there. Uh, you know, we, there was Muscle Beach and I would pick up soda pop bottles uh, to, uh, to collect two cents on each bottle and then be able to go to a little magic shop that was there to buy yeah. cheap <laughs> magic it, trips. And it tricks. sounds idyllic. That sounds very idyllic. Yeah, it was. I loved, I loved it there. Yeah. And, uh, 
of course, I was a kid, but there was no sense of crime or uh, yeah. anything like that. And uh, so it's shocking to me, really shocking to hear what happened in the interim. And uh, Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, in, in the 70s and 80s when cocaine became uh, such a, uh, a, a force in the country, really all across the country and, and Los Angeles as well. Uh, the gangs, the shoreline Crips had different territories and they actually moved into Venice. They moved into the Oakwood neighborhood of Venice, which is ghost town. And they had a stronghold there and it was really the epicenter of the drug activity on the West side of Los Angeles. And, you know, anytime you walked into that neighborhood, there would be dozens of dealers on the corners. Um, and the, the inhabitants of that neighborhood lived in fear. That, were, that's so bizarre because, because beach communities, you know, on both coasts have always been uh, places for the wealthy. And uh, yes. it's just, I, you know, I don't but, know how they got established there, except I guess they were making a lot of money selling dope. Well, it's, it's a one, it's a one square mile radius of this neighborhood. And it is actually where a lot of the uh, servants live uh -huh. for the wealthy. Yeah. Dennis, okay. Which that... the, the wealthy lived on the canals. So in the twenties after the canals were built, by Abbot Kinney, and he was trying to replicate the Venice canals. There were all of these people that needed housing. And so they built this neighborhood called Oakwood, and it's where a lot of the chauffeurs and a lot of the servants and, and, and gardeners and people lived. And then after World War II, World War II many of the Holocaust survivors um, and Jewish immigrants moved into the neighborhood as well mm -hmm. because it was affordable housing. Yeah, and then the when the when the drug culture began to explode in the eighties, it was there were already there was a there was a large African American community there already, and the Shoreline Crips just moved in and began to rent houses and had family members rent houses, and it became really like a like a war zone. Yeah, that's uh, what I get from you know um, what led you to write such a self-revealing book about your years of addiction. I mean, you, you know, you, you don't necessarily come off looking that good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, did I you struggle to, with that or not? You know, I don't, it's interesting, you know, because of my recovery and because of the work that I've done around forgiveness and self-forgiveness and forgiving others, I don't carry around any shame or any guilt Good for or you. any negative feelings around the experience at all um, uh, or any of the experiences yeah. of my life. I yeah. feel like I'm a human being and, and I was doing my best. And, right. uh, as, as, as we all do, right. As we, as we hope to do. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to remain true to the story and be self-reflective certainly and uh, be authentic and, so I felt as though it was important for me to to really delve into the details of, of what happened. And, um, you know, I, um, I really struggled at that time in my life. And in my practice now, uh, I feel like there is a, a level of empathy that I can have for others that are struggling with a, a number of different situations. Sure. That, uh, that, as you know, as a psychologist, is the archetype of the wounded healer. We work out of our own wounding. Yes. And that has certainly been true for me in my experience. As, um, as a psychologist now, looking back, do you see any factors um, in your early life or genetically or whatever that set you up for addiction? Well, I feel as though, you know, I have a, a unique perspective on addiction, which we can talk about later, but the, certainly I grew up in, uh, in an affluent community. My parents were both successful. We had money. We lived in a, in a beautiful home in Georgetown in Washington, DC. 
And so from, from the exterior, it would seem that everything would be wonderful. Yeah. But when you pulled back the curtain, um, which we rarely do, right, in, in terms of people's families, uh, it really was an unhappy home. And there was a lot of uh, fighting between my parents. Uh, my mother was an alcoholic. And she really wasn't able to be present for me in the way that I needed. And my father was a, a workaholic. He was an absent father. He was away more than 50% of the time. And he was also a narcissist um, who was very self-involved. And so it's almost if I, as I, if, if psychologically I grew up with um, two parents that were perhaps the same age that I was and struggling with their own Past and their own uh, dysfunctional habits, and I didn't get the the love that I really needed to to find a healthy identity. Mm-hmm. And from a very early age, I I didn't feel as though I was valuable. I didn't feel as though I was worthwhile. I was very confused about who I was. Yeah, yeah. and I think that. Um, there were certain events in my childhood along with that that led to my first real addiction, which was eating disorders. And I developed an eating disorder at age 11. And at that time in the early 1980s, I think it was about 1980 for a a young boy to have an eating disorder was very um, uncommon and people didn't know what to do with me. They had no idea how to treat it. And so they just, uh, it just uh, was relatively ignored. What, what kind of eating disorder, how did it manifest itself? It manifested first as anorexia, and then I became bulimic. Uh-huh. And, and that, um, that is something that stayed with me for about 10 years, wow. um, you know, throughout my high school years and in college as well. My goodness. And it, uh, it was a way for me to feel like a life that was out of control was in control. And it was that, uh-huh. that yes. just little bit of control that I had and to control what went in and out of my body and to control my physical appearance. Yeah. You mentioned college. Where, where did you go to college? I went to uh, a college on the East coast called Trinity college, which was, uh, which is in Hartford, Connecticut. And uh-huh. It's a small liberal arts school. And, um, I I really don't feel as though college was a was a great experience for me. It was more of a place to go and continue my self medication. And so, there was a lot of alcohol there. I was in a fraternity, and we drank a lot, did minimal amounts of work, mm-hmm. and uh, it wasn't really a growth experience for me. Yeah, yeah, and. and um, but um, I, uh, my addiction really continued on, and, and I moved to New York City. I began producing independent films there and was involved in the entertainment industry. And I was introduced to cocaine in New York. Uh, it was prevalent. It was around. People were doing it. Um, it seemed like everywhere you went. In, and in and the, initial, the initial... Press for for cocaine was that it w- wasn't addictive, and yeah. uh, amazingly, you know that oh, yeah. it's not addictive and it's just a fun thing that you can do as a party drug, and right. it turned out not to be true. It's true. Well, I I don't have any judgment uh, against the people that are that use it recreationally. I think that people should make their own decisions about things, and as long as it's not affecting their life in a negative way. But for me, it really got its hooks in me, and I began to use it on a fairly regular basis. And I decided to leave New York. Um, some some things happened in my life. My my father was uh, was involved in a embezzlement scheme in a company in Washington, and and they. Uh, paraded him around 60 minutes and he didn't interview, uh, which really ruined his credibility. And so he had to leave the country. Oh, wow. 
and that really destroyed his career. So he left the country and he moved to England and he really didn't come back until the final years of his life when he was dying of Alzheimer's. And uh, so that really impacted my life negatively. And, and also at that time, my mother in her deep alcoholism uh, attempted to, to kill herself. She attempted suicide. And so it was a very dark time in my life. And I think once again, I looked to the drugs and as, as an escape for the pain. I moved to Los Angeles thinking that I was going to um, have some distance from my family and have some safety and realized that Los Angeles was no different from New York, that the drugs were readily available. There were even more of them here. And um, that led to my, my um, continued spiral downwards. Well, it was, went, was part of your going to L.A., uh, I think, you know, thinking of getting involved with Hollywood since you had some was. experience as a filmmaker? And that was part of it. That was part of it. Another part of it was I, I just had this notion that L.A. was a healthy place, that people did yoga and they went for walks on the beach and they um, were concerned with, you know, eating a macrobiotic diet and mm-hmm. And I just had, I'd always, I'd never been to Los Angeles. I'd lived on the East Coast my whole life. And I felt that there was more of a progressive um, ideology out here about health. And, but I wasn't ready for it. It was just a fantasy. <laughs> so yeah. I arrived here. And of course, I continued on the same path that I was on. Um, I finally went to treatment and stayed for 30 days. And when I got out of treatment is when I moved to Venice. And once again, I wasn't really consciously aware that Venice was this uh, very dangerous place, especially for someone who'd struggled with, with addiction. But perhaps unconsciously, I was pushed over there because I wanted to continue using. And so the story of the book really takes place in that time, 2003 in Venice, and that's the present tense of the book. And then the uh, every other chapter takes a look at my childhood and my teen years and my young adulthood and really tells the story of how I got there. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so you were, you know, the, you mentioned the Shoreline Crips, a, a black, yes. a black gang. And here you yes, are, a, a white, a white guy, kind of a slender yeah. A slender white guy at that, I think, and that's the impression yeah. I got. And yeah. uh, uh, it was a really, yeah, it was the fusion of two very different worlds. And uh, so, so how did you manage to survive? You, you must have some natural survival skills that uh, brought you through that. As, well, I, I felt like there were times where I, I really wasn't sure I wanted to survive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, why do some people survive and other people don't? Because the, you know, the substances that I was putting into my body could have killed me at any moment. Um, and, uh, but at that time, I was really uh, saved by this African-American family in, in Ghost Town. And I became friends with this drug dealer named Flynn. And he really took me under his wing, showed me the ways of the streets. He vouched for me. And he really wasn't your typical drug dealer. He was self-educated. He was book smart. He was well-read. He was intellectual. He was spiritual and kind. And he was generous. And he was family-oriented. And, and he and his grandmother, who brought him up, uh, invited me into their home and uh, really showed me the kind of love and the kind of acceptance that I had not received from my own family. And so it was really their protection that helped me get through all of this. And, yeah, uh, that, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And it really uh, it, it sort of highlights that um, – there are pockets like that in in dangerous neighborhoods, and yes. and you know we tend to have blanket judgments about people who live in those neighborhoods and so on. I I myself actually grew up for much of my life in uh, 
in West LA where the uh, riots were, and yes. and uh, my mother had married an African American man who was really the only father that uh, that I knew was raised with, and and so we had sort of an extended family in the black community, and yeah. so I, I had lots of uh, interesting experiences myself, and and sometimes didn't feel safe in the neighborhood that we lived in, of and um, but. Like you, I was a good talker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, talked my way out of a lot of situations. And also right. you mentioned that Flynn kind of uh, stood up for you. He did. And I had a stepbrother in one situation where uh, he, he – and, and in other situations too, I would somehow manage to bond with one of the tough guys, you know, yeah. and, and then that got me through. But yeah. back to your story. Yeah. Uh, um, I imagine that some bridges maybe got burned with past family, friends, and colleagues from your earlier life. Did sure? Yeah. Yeah, you know, the there were several people that I knew that aren't a part of my life anymore, and uh, I think that's really the natural progression of life, regardless of whether you're an addict, is that as you grow older, uh, there's a distillation of uh, who uh, your friends really are. And the ones that really you have a a strong, loving bond with are the ones that are going to remain. And, and, at first, I, I felt, when I was first getting sober, I felt a, a sense of loss, a real sense of grief, that I was giving up an old life and that I was this uh, gregarious person who liked to go out and celebrate life and drink. And, and um, I became more introspective and um, a bit more introverted. Um, and that was a change for me. It was a departure from the way I was. And, and, but there are a, a handful of friends and I, and I always say that you only need a real handful of close friends that, that stood by my side through all of it. Wow. And they are still my great friends today. And, and you know, some of them are from, from boarding school. Uh, and I've been, close friends with them for 35 years yeah, and some great. of them are my New York friends that uh, I uh, have been friends with for over 25 years and and they were all rooting for me you know they all wanted me to get better they didn't really know the specifics of what was happening because I didn't have a cell phone I didn't have a computer I didn't have really any contact with the outside world mm-hmm. when I was in Venice during this time but they knew that I wasn't doing well and they were afraid that they were going to get a phone call from someone, as was my family, that uh, that I was found dead somewhere. Yeah. And that almost happened. Um, but when I started to heal and I started to get better and take care of myself, uh, those friends that were, were really my true friends, they came back into my life. That's wonderful. I'll let you uh, move forward, but I, I, I wanted to ask you about the scariest encounter you, you mentioned that you almost got killed. What was the scariest encounter during your time in Ghost Town? Well, there were a few of them. Um, I I was hired by a senior member of, of the Shoreline Crips to do a run down to San Diego to pick up uh, a number of kilos of cocaine. And, and I met uh, a group in a motel room that were from the a Mexican cartel oh and they pulled me into the room and they, uh, they zip tied my arms behind my back and they threw me in the corner and they, um, pointed machine guns at me. And I really felt as though that might be it. Yeah, that sounds pretty close to being it. Yeah. Right. And uh, I managed, as you said, to talk my way out of it. Um, um, and, uh, feel very fortunate. And, and another incident was when I had uh, disrespected some members of, of the gang and they um, 
took out a contract on my life. Oh boy. And they were coming to find me. And I had to hide in the basement of my apartment building all, all night long. And they actually came into the room and they didn't see me and they left. And, uh, so that was really probably the most frightening moment uh, of my life. Uh, I, that would, time. I would say so. Did in the basement, and there were a number of uh, gang members looking for me to, to execute me. Did you get, quotes scared straight at that point? Well, you would, you would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you would think so. But I ended up taking a bus to the airport and narrowly escaping, left all of my stuff in Venice, and I um, went and arrived at our family farm in Massachusetts. And my mother was living there with her then boyfriend. And they were alcoholics and pill addicts. And so it wasn't a great environment for me. And uh, But I didn't have any other place to go. And so for the next year, I continued um, with substance abuse. And the moment really that everything changed for me was I was in a car accident. I was driving down our driveway in Massachusetts. I veered off the road. I'd fallen asleep at the wheel and I hit a tree going about 50 miles an hour and was not wearing a seatbelt. Boy. And the dashboard of the car came shooting out and I went underneath it. And, but I broke some ribs and I ruptured my spleen and I had a concussion. And I dislocated my knee. I had lacerations from the glass um, all over my legs. And I was in intensive care for a few in the hospital for a few weeks. And I was lying there in the hospital bed, uh, age 33. And I was strapped down to the bed because they were trying to save my spleen. So I had straps across my chest and straps across my legs. Okay. okay, so for our audience, we lost our connection uh, with the Internet, and now we're back, and I'm going to weld the two parts together. So you were uh, just starting to tell us about that you hit a tree, and and, yes. uh, and you got all busted up. So take up th yes. the story so from I there, was, if you uh, will. I was driving down our driveway in Massachusetts, and I hit a tree going about 50 miles an hour. And the, the, I was not wearing a seatbelt and the dashboard of the car came straight out and I was, was launched underneath the dashboard as it came out. But mm -hmm. I, I broke some ribs. I had a ruptured spleen. I had a concussion. I dislocated my knee and I had lacerations, uh, severe lacerations on, on my legs from the glass. And I was brought to intensive care for a few days and remained in the hospital for a few weeks. And at that time, they were trying to save my spleen. So they had me strapped down to a hospital bed. They had my chest strapped down and my arms strapped down so I couldn't move. Oh, my God. They had my legs strapped down. And I had uh, a uh, an attendant come and change my bedpan and feed me uh, and because I didn't have use of my arms. And I thought to myself, well, this is the moment in my life where I have to make a decision. I've lost all my power. I can't even feed myself or go to the bathroom on my own. And I can either choose life or I can choose death at this point. And uh, something in me really decided that I wanted to finally go down the path of getting help. And so I went to treatment, which was in uh, long-term treatment, which started in Arizona. And then I ended up for several months at an aftercare facility in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that's where my healing really started. Uh, I began to do uh, alternative therapies, non-traditional therapies, uh, trauma work, which was incredibly important for me, um, began to learn, really, really begin to uh, get in touch with a lost side of me, something I'd covered up for so long, which was my spirituality. And after I got out of treatment, I decided to 
move to Santa Fe and, and not go back to Los Angeles, but to stay in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I remained for five years. And I applied to graduate school. I took out student loans and I worked two jobs. And initially, you know, I had, I had no money at all. I lived in a, uh, in a small efficiency that was furnished that cost $300 a month. And that was really difficult for me to pay. And it came with an old rickety 10 speed bike. And when I arrived out of treatment, it was the dead of winter. It was about zero degrees out. I didn't have winter clothes and I had to ride around on this rickety old 10 speed bike to job interviews. And, uh, that's how I started my life in sobriety. Wow. Wow. So was that a rehab center that you were at? It was. It was called the Life Healing Center mm-hmm. in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It was the, an amazing place. It uh, had maybe 12 to 18 patients at a time. And I had a therapist there that uh, was a, a Vietnam vet, this really amazing spiritual man who did trauma work with me and led me back into some of these different times in my life. Uh, where I experienced emotional and um, psychological trauma and helped me begin the process of releasing that from my system. Now, how were you paying for that? It was, um, I had had insurance Uh and uh, that was paid for by my family. That's sort of the last thing that they gave to me. Yeah. And, and that's what, because they, you know, they were concerned with my health and of course I couldn't pay insurance. And, and so that was sort of the final gift that I received from them. Oh, you made, um, you made good use of it. So was that I a, a, a 12 step program? Was that part of it? It was a 12 step. Um, I did get sober through the 12 steps and I was very active in the program for a number of years. And, uh, but I believe that the, the program, the, the, the different programs, um, certainly are valuable, but, uh, the principles that you learn in the program can be applied in everyday life. Yeah. Uh, and the, the real benefit of the program for me was to be around people that had gone through similar things. And I had spent a lot of my time alone, um, isolated um, in my drug addiction. And and it was really nice to um, be in a community of people that had gone through, uh, who had stories that were similar to mine. Not exactly, but uh, similar. And and to forge some friendships. And, and some of those people are, are still my friends today, which is, which is wonderful. Yeah. So boy, the 12 wonderful. steps for me were really about a community. Um, that uh, that made me feel as though I was part of something again. Yeah. Now you mentioned, uh, I think, at the start of our conversation that that you've developed your own uh, th- uh, theory of of addiction and, yes. tr- and treatment. So this would be a good place to bring that in. Yes. Well, I'm you know I'm writing a second book now. Okay. And it's about addiction. It's more of a pop psychology book, popular psychology. And it really talks about addiction and um, it, it, it is, it focuses on this idea that we have as a culture that addiction really refers to uh, our substance abuse with, with, alcohol or with drugs, with narcotics, with pills, and also gambling. You know, people talk about, oh, he's a gambling addict. But um, but my belief is more that addiction is archetypal, meaning that it's something that we all know and we all share energetically at some point in our lives in some capacity. And I believe that energy is addiction. I, 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 that, I, that addiction is energy. It's not something that is passed through our DNA, and it's not something that um, we have to hold on for the to for the rest of our lives. 
It's something that we can release. And it's collective energy that's out that consolates at certain points in our life inside of our psyche. And um, the that energy is really prevalent in our culture today, in the world today. And when you think about people's relationships with their telephones, their smartphones, mm. and how committed to them they are and obsessed with them they are. We carry them around in our pockets. We check them hundreds of times a day when we don't need to check them. There's a compulsion. There's an obsession and a compulsion. And, and that's all addiction really is. It's an energy that creates an obsession in the mind that leads to a compulsive action. And that's all it really is. And so we see that with people with their phones, with their video games, with exercise, with vanity. You know, there's a, a, a real focus in our culture now on, on looking younger and how we do that with, you know, getting shots and doing different things. Um, but that is an addiction. And there's, there's work addiction. There, is, there are food addictions. There are addictions to sex and to love. And so, so I believe that addiction is something that every one of us has felt the energy of and it is it shouldn't be something that is stigmatized and thought of as a negative it is just something that is and it floats in and out of our lives at certain times and uh and so this is what my my book is is really going to focus on and it um hopefully will um alleviate some of the demonization of addiction as a disease. You know, people are saying, oh, you have a disease or this is a terrible thing that you're involved in or, you know, that I want to I want to de demystify that and mm -hmm. demythologize that and say that no addiction is really if, if you look at it a bit differently, it is really something that we all share uh, nationally here in the United States and globally. What is your advice to anyone listening or watching? Uh, yeah, the audio will go up on YouTube as well. Um, to anyone who is listening to this interview who might be struggling with addiction, uh, do you, is there any kind of advice? Or yes, I, I, of course. Um, we tend to, at certain times in our lives, if we're really addicted to say substances think and there's no way for me to escape this loop this is uh this is a continual loop of me um wanting to get the drugs finding a way uh to get money to get them using and then coming down and it's this loop and there's a lot of suffering that takes place and what i would say to you is that there is a way out there is a uh, another side that this is not that addiction is not a death sentence. It's um, something that is not does not have to be with you for your entire life. And uh, I'm living proof of that um, because I'm addiction free at this point and uh, because I don't feel like the addiction was mine. I felt as though I could release it. And I would say if there's one person that, you know, that is healthy or is spiritual or is not addicted, um, that a friend or a family member or a counselor that you could reach out to just one person and let them know that you need help, that you've lost your way and that you need help. Just that one person, that one phone call that can help to develop a relationship that will pull you out of where you are right now and start you on the path of healing. And that's what it was for me. It was really um, small steps forward and uh, small steps that led to big changes. Yeah. And what about um, therapists who are listening? Uh, do you have any recommendations to therapists about dealing with addicted clients? Well, what I would say is um, if you're dealing with serious addiction as a therapist, if it's not something that you really understand, then um, be honest about that. Be authentic about that. Don't pretend like you uh, are an expert when mm -hmm. you're not, because the people that are really suffering need 
to connect with somebody who really understands what they're going through. So be authentic about what your resources are and what your experiences are. And, um, uh, and, and, and if you don't feel like you're right for someone, refer them somewhere else, I would say. Um, in terms of a lot of the addictive energy that we're talking about, um, the advice that I would give to therapists would be to, um, let's try and change the pervasive attitude about what addiction is. Let's try to, to, to take away the, uh, the negative connotations that ha- that it has. Let's try and embrace it. You know, I, I, I tell my patients that, um, I want them to love all parts of themselves, not just the good parts, not just the parts that are more desirable, but all of the parts. And addiction is one of the parts that we experience sometimes. So it may sound counterintuitive, but I say, love your addiction. Love it. It's a part of you. It's a part of your woundedness. And the closer you get to it and the better you understand it, the more it's going to diminish and go away. Yeah, I would not probably be the first person to observe that of that often with with addicted people there is a a soulfulness there um and that you know maybe it can be thought of as a as a ultimately a spiritual hunger yeah um that they're trying to feed uh, you know there is uh a lot written about the fact that sometimes people are on a quest to find spirituality and that's why they embrace spirits, right? They call alcohol spirits or, yeah, or, right. or substances to try and um, have a union with something that is on a higher plane of existence. And whether that's unconscious or conscious, I think it's mainly unconscious. But this desire to find what is holy, what is spiritual uh, can also be something that drives them. Um, But, you know, recovery, as I have uh, experienced it, really is uh, so much about spirituality. And it's how I've stayed sober for so long. I have a spiritual practice that I uh, engage in with every morning um, that I've developed over the years. And uh, I try to be as loving as a father and a husband as I can to my family. Uh, I try to be honest and I try to do the right thing and live a moral life. And those are things that help me to feel good about who I am and, and what I'm doing in the world. But also this, this connection to spirituality, I think really helps us find and, and steer us towards uh, having a purpose. And I think having a life's purpose is so important to, to feel as though you're being, um, that, that, that your life has meaning that you're doing something important, that you're moving forward, that you're evolving, that you're growing. And uh, that's really what has, has helped me over the years to have have uh, have sobriety in my life is this real sense of meaning and this, this sense of purpose that comes from community, that comes from family, that comes from spirituality. Well, that's a good, uh, strong statement, I think, for us to wrap this up on. And so, Dr. Yeah. Carter Stout, I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you so much for having me. And, and I just want to close with, if anyone is uh, this time that we're in right now, um, there are, uh, uh, I, I think there's ample time to read So if you're interested in the story that uh, we were talking about today, which is my memoir, it's called Lost in Ghost Town, and you can buy it on Amazon. And uh, really hope you enjoy it.
What is your advice to anyone listening or watching? Uh, yeah, the audio will go up on YouTube as well. Um, to anyone who is listening to this interview who might be struggling with addiction, uh, you, is there any kind of advice? Or yes, I, I, of course. Um, we tend to, at certain times in our lives, if we're really addicted to, say, substances, think there's no way for me to escape this loop. This is uh, this is a continual loop of me um, wanting to get the drugs, finding a way uh, to get money to get them, using and then coming down. And it's this loop. And there's a lot of suffering that takes place. And what I would say to you is that there is a way out. There is a uh, another side that this is not that addiction is not a death sentence. It's um, something that is not does not have to be with you for your entire life. And uh, I'm living proof of that um, because I'm addiction free at this point uh, because I don't feel like the addiction was mine. I felt as though. I could release it. And I would say if there's one person that you know that is healthy or is spiritual or is not addicted, um, that a friend or a family member or a counselor that you could reach out to, just one person, and let them know that you need help, that you've lost your way and that you need help. Just that one person, that one phone call, that can help to develop a relationship that will pull you out of where you are right now and start you on the path of healing. And that's what it was for me. It was really um, small steps forward and uh, small steps that led to big changes. Yeah. And what about um, therapists who are listening? Uh, do you have any recommendations to therapists about dealing with addicted clients? Well, what I would say is... Um, if you're dealing with serious addiction as a therapist, if it's not something that you really understand, then um, be honest about that. Be authentic about that. Don't pretend like you uh, are an expert when you're not because the people that are really suffering need to connect with somebody who really understands what they're going through. So be authentic about what your resources are and what your experiences are. And, um, uh, and, and, and if you don't feel like you're right for someone, refer them somewhere else, I would say. Um, in terms of a lot of the addictive energy that we're talking about, um, the advice that I would give to therapists would be to, um, let's try and change the pervasive attitude about what addiction is. Let's try to, to, to take away the, uh, the negative connotations that ha that it has. Let's try and embrace it. You know, I, I, I tell my patients that um, I want them to love all parts of themselves, not just the good parts, not just the parts that are more desirable, but all of the parts. And addiction is one of the parts that we experience sometimes. So it may sound counterintuitive, but I say love your addiction. Love it. It's a part of you. It's a part of your woundedness. And the closer you get to it and the better you understand it, the more it's going to diminish and go away. Yeah, I would not probably be the first person to observe that. Uh, that often with with addicted people, there is a, a soulfulness there. Um, yes, and that you know maybe it can be thought of as a, as a, ultimately a spiritual hunger. Yes. That, um, that they're yes, trying to uh, feed. You know, there is uh, a lot written about the fact that sometimes people are on a quest to find spirituality, and that's why they embrace spirits, right? They call alcohol spirits or, yeah, or, right. or substances to try and um, have a union with something that is on a higher plane of existence. And whether that's unconscious or conscious, I think it's mainly unconscious. But this desire to find what is holy, what is spiritual, uh, can also be something that drives them. Um, but, you know, recovery, as I have uh, experienced it, really 
is uh, so much about spirituality, and it's how I've stayed sober for so long. I have a spiritual practice that I uh, engage in with every morning um, that I've developed over the years, and uh, I try to be as loving as a father and a husband as I can to my family. Uh, I try to be honest, and I try to do the right thing and live a moral life, and those are things that help me to feel good about who I am and, and what I'm doing in the world. But also this, this connection to spirituality, I think really helps us find and, and steer us towards uh, having a purpose. And I think having a life's purpose is so important to, to feel as though you're being, um, that, that, that your life has meaning, that you're doing something important, that you're moving forward, that you're evolving, that you're growing. And uh, that's really what has, has helped me over the years to have have uh, have sobriety in my life is this real sense of meaning and this this sense of purpose that comes from community, that comes from family, that comes from spirituality. Well, that's a good, uh, strong statement, I think, for us to wrap this up on. And so, Dr. Yeah. Carter Stout, I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you so much for having me. And, and I just want to close with if anyone is uh, this time that we're in right now, um, there are, uh, uh, I, I think there's ample time to read. So if you're interested in the story that uh, we were talking about today, which is my memoir, it's called Lost in Ghost Town. And you can buy it on Amazon. And uh, really hope you enjoy it. 